population of Hollis is around 2,400. And its location is as far south in southwest Oklahoma as you can get. And if you went about 10 miles south, you would hit Red River, across which is Texas. Darrell was born here in Hollis in uh, 1924. Uh, his father was a businessman, uh, a very well-to-do businessman. It was the stock market crash uh, in the 20s. Uh, they lost everything. Dust Bowl hit it pretty hard. Grew up, you know, dirt poor uh, during the Depression days, sleeping with a, a wet dust rag, you know, over his mouth to keep from breathing all, all that dust in. In the Depression, took the uh, took the Oki migration. His dad took him out to uh, California. He gets out there, he doesn't like it. So he got a letter from a coach here in Hollis, uh, inviting him to play football. Daryl hitchhiked all the way back to Hollis. Football is what brought him back to Oklahoma from California. By the time he was a, a junior and senior, he was an all-state quarterback from Hollis. And about 1944, he got letters from several different universities, but he wanted to go to the University of Oklahoma. Unbeaten Oklahoma in the running for national football honors. This fall is showing the power of its devastating new formation, the split T. And he gets to OU just at the perfect time at uh, the arrival of Bud Wilkinson and Jim Tatum. A tremendous all-around player, no doubt about it, and, and just completely beloved by, by Bud Wilkinson. Anybody really associated with OU football from that era. I've seen some of the highlights and, and clips that, you know, that are shown now and, and make it a point to try and watch them. An exceptional athlete, could do so many things, um, could do everything. Wilkinson was constantly trying to figure out a way to make Royal the quarterback and Jack Mitchell moving to halfback. But then in 1949, you know, the program's been great, everything's going good. Darrell Royal takes over as the senior quarterback. Uh, Bud Wilkinson loved Darrell Royal as a ball player because he could run he could run that split tee, but he could also throw. Royal, Royal throws a quick pass out. It's complete to go, and he's over. Touchdown, Royal. Uh, they go 11-0. If you made a list of the top three OU teams of, of all time, the 1949 team is one of them, and Darrell Royal quarterbacked it. He held punting records. Still holds the uh, OU record for interceptions. He was an All-American, uh, both as a quarterback and a punter when it comes to college football playing, he was as good as a guy. During the years that we played at Oklahoma from 46 through 48, uh, I think probably every boy on our squad gained more satisfaction out of beating Texas, I believe, for the first time in eight or 10 years. Uh, there hadn't been any boys recently experienced that, and I think that that was probably the game we liked most. Well, that's gotten to be a very familiar story up at Oklahoma since, hasn't it? <laughs> What's interesting is Darrell Royal's career between Oklahoma and Texas. He'd been three stops, you know, he'd been at Washington, Mississippi State, uh, in the CFL, in Edmonton. Yeah, I wouldn't think Texas would be real high on his list when he was an Okie. We still make fun of Coach, Coach Wright, who coached at Texas and now coaches with us. It's one of those things where we're like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, how'd you do that? Texas was a job you have to take. Mac Brown always says, you want that kind of job where you're the university of. You're going to have some advantages and resources other schools don't. When he was being interviewed by the selection committee, including a student member, a uh, regent, he called everybody by their first name. So this was a guy that did his homework, and it didn't matter whether it was preparing for the biggest game of the year or preparing for a job interview that could change his life. It was just you know, meticulous in his game planning. I mean, you don't meet too many people that has anything to say about Darrell Royal other than just pure class. Uh, the preparation for games, the practice, all that. I mean, he was, uh, you know, just a great, great football coach. I think he learned a lot of that from Bud Wilkinson. 1957, when he came to Texas, Oklahoma had been pretty dominating. In fact, the Sooners were in the midst of that long winning streak that is a national record, still is, in fact, today. To be coaching against the coach during your playing days, uh, I would think it'd be overwhelming, but Darrell wasn't a guy that shrank from a challenge. Make a list of the top 20 coaches in college football history. Darrell Royal and Bud Wilkinson are on the list, and one of them played for the other. 
And I think that was, you know, that was a crossroads game. The second game against OU when he pulls out the win, 15-14, the classic game. Great for his program, great for his guys, but he had to beat his mentor to do it. It was very, very, very rough emotionally on Darrell Royal. Bud Wilkinson goes to congratulate Darrell. He finds him in the back of the locker room in the bathroom throwing up. Beating Bud Wilkinson, beating Oklahoma, that was just one of the obstacles. You know, he had to check off his list if he was going to, you know, rebuild Texas into the dominant program that it was. The number one program in America uh, in the 60s was the Texas Longhorns. You know, once he got that thing turned around, he owned Oklahoma for the first half of his career. And in some ways, Darrell Royal's arrival in Austin put a dent in the rivalry because uh, while Bud and, and the Sooners had dominated for so long, when Royal won in 58, all of a sudden they started winning forever. And they won uh, 12 out of 13 games against the Sooners. The 63 game was probably the pivotal contest for Coach Royal's career at Texas because Oklahoma was number one, Texas was number two. Texas won and maintained that and won the national championship. Mostly the people uh, who are in favor of your program and endorse your program, usually they remain quiet. It's the cranks and the fanatics that sound off. As you they had like uh, three straight four lost seasons in the mid-60s. And there were some, including Frank Irwin uh, of the Board of Regents, that were not calling for his ouster, but was really there was a lot of grumbling in the fan base. The role of the quarterback in the wishbone offense is, is essentially a decision maker. With the advent of the wishbone, he got it back. Well, on the left of your screen, you see the Texas wishbone Y. He changed uh, the scope of college football when he invented the wishbone with, with Emory Ballard. He re-energized the program. We were watching this. This was about 1968. And all of a sudden, we recognize that defensively, you just don't have enough people on the corners of perimeter defenses to defend it because they outnumber you. And so it was three on two, two on one, and one on none. And it, we just said that isn't fair. And it became a problem. You had the 30 game win streak. Back in that time in the 60s, <laughs> You know, we, there were three channels, basically. As the Sooners of Oklahoma, led by Heisman Trophy candidate Steve Owens, faced Darrell Royal's dazzling triple option offense. Darrell Royal was always one of the icons we grew up with. Oh, good luck. Thank you. And going to throw to Randy Peschel, and Peschel catches the ball. It was just kind of a magic about the program. Darrell Royal still has to make his attack. Here he comes. Okay. Darrell was kind of the toast of college football there in the late 60s. Won the 69 national title with the great unbeaten wishbone team. Won the UPI title in 70. He was at the very pinnacle of college football. Barry Switzer wanted to go to the wishbone before uh, mid-season 1970. He tried to talk Chuck Fairbanks into going to it earlier. Darrell was great at letting that, o that OU staff come down and sort of learn more about the bone and think about that in today's uh, world. Uh, Mac Brown going to invite Bob Stoops in on Texas secrets, not going to happen. But 40 years ago when, you know, Darrell Royal, it was a different time, different kind of men. I said, Chuck, we need to be doing what Texas is doing. We need to make a change. We got open date. We need to go to Wishbone right now. And the Wishbone became the rage of college football. Once Oklahoma adopted the Wishbone, the tide turned. When Barry came in, it was like the new kid on the block, you know. He's got the new hot rod car and, you know, peeling out and then, you know, right in front of your face. And he was an in-your-face kind of coach. You got to beat my ass. You got to stop me on Saturday. He was kind of the antithesis of Daryl. And I think Daryl resented that, not just because of who Barry was, but the fact that he was doing it as our rival. 1976 was my first year on the beat. On a Wednesday night, Darrell calls me up about uh, six o'clock after a practice, said, I got a good story for you. And it was kind of a story that kind of rocked the nation because uh, Darrell called Barry Switzer a liar, accused him of spying on his practices, stealing information. You know, those are the kind of tips you live for. We spied on 1972, but we're talking about semantics here. Chuck was a head coach in 1972. Darrell didn't find out about it until about 74, 5, or 6. And of course, I knew that they had. And the reason they had, we had a guy that coached with one of our assistant coaches that was in Austin. He says, hey, I've been out of practice the last couple of days, and, and we happened to be playing them that week. We beat them 27 nothing, by the way. 
and uh, they, the Alan Lowry was shifting to uh, uh, spread uh, quick kick, shifting to the quick kick from quarterback back to the quick kick. And Texas all of a sudden came out close to the goal line down there, and they were going quick kick on third down. As soon as they came out and shifted to that, our defensive tackles now took an inside rush. They blocked the thing, knock it back in the end zone. Both the other tackle runs in the end zone, falls on it, and we got a touchdown out of the play. Well, that's, of course, you know, that's information that paid off. The next day after our story broke, where Darrell accused OU of spying, uh, Robert Hurd was Associated Press reporter, went and interviewed Darrell in his office the next day. And uh, that was the, the day where uh, Darrell called Oklahoma those uh, bastards. And Darrell thought the interview was over and it was off the record. And uh, the story uh, included that quote. And boy, did that stir everything up. And I'll never forget the day of the game, uh, 1976, that October, during the warm-ups. Uh, Oklahoma players are openly taunting Darrell Roy on the field. And the uh, Oklahoma fans are, are jeering Darrell Roy at every step and taunting him with the, the dirty bastards quote. Part of his life had been Oklahoma and he was proud of that. And for him to be um, shunned because he had stood up for what was right really bothered him. Gerald Ford, uh, the president, was there for the opening coin toss. Oh my God. I don't think Gerald Ford had any idea what he was getting into. On one side of him was Barry, on the other side was Darrell. They wouldn't even look at each other. And we got the bottom of the ramp and some redneck from Oklahoma stands up in his red and polyester and he yells out and screams, who are those two so it's with Switzer. And uh, of course, I felt about like this, you know, it embarrassed the hell out of me. And I well remember the, the long walk and it seemed extra long. Those two guys weren't talking and President Ford's in the middle and he'd talk a little while over here and talk a little while over here. And <laughs> they'd walk to the center of the field. We in the press were all allowed to go down there for the opening coin toss in midfield, if you can believe that now. So I thought, well, this is gonna be a, a game for the ages. It was a game that Texas dominated, defensive game. And, it led 6-0. Oklahoma recovered a fumble by Ivy Subaru around the 33-yard line. It took them about 12 plays to score, but then they had a high snap on the extra point, and that was botched and ended with a tie. And, and even that kind of seemed fitting. I think that was uh, the game that kind of led to Darrell's decision to step down. It is final, and uh, I've uh, gone in my last locker room as coach. 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 I think Darrell always regretted you know, leaving the game at age 52. He stayed on his AD for three years, but you know, that was not Daryl, not sitting behind a desk. He needed to be out uh, with the, the golfers and the pickers. And through teardrops and laughter, they will pass through this world hand in hand. And the beauty of Darrell was just the fact that uh, people were drawn to him. He treated the janitor the same way he did the president. And he's a guy also that changed society and changed lives. Royal died early this morning after a bout with Alzheimer's. I got down on my knees and cried like a baby because it's like a father. Such a role model for all of us, the way he conducted his life. I respected Darrell. I had a great admiration for him. Wished I could have been a better friend. A lot of OU fans get a charge out of the fact that an Oklahoman's name is on the stadium at Texas. Coach Royal loved Oklahoma. He loved playing there. And at the same time, he said, uh, I'm a Longhorn. I've been here 50 years. He's really not thought of as an Oklahoma hero just because of that rivalry. He definitely should be.